Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this Friday night or Saturday morning for those of you tuning in from Southeast Asia. My name is Emily Zinger. I'm the Southeast Asia Digital Librarian at Cornell University, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this, our first webinar in the series Across the Archives. Before I begin, I'd like to thank several supporters who have made today's talk possible. First, thank you to Cornell's Southeast Asia program, especially to Ava White, who has managed the technical side of this event. Thank you to the Committee on Research Materials on Southeast Asia and the Southeast Asia Digital Library for additionally sponsoring our talks tonight. Thank you to the staff at Cornell's Rare and Manuscript Collections for their hard work leading up to today. And thank you also to the University of Michigan, in particular, Susan Goh, for their support of this idea from the beginning. In my role as digital librarian, I'm keenly aware of the benefits that arise from digitizing archival materials and making them openly available on the internet. These projects dramatically expand our access to collections, enabling scholars from around the world to conduct research that might otherwise be out of reach due to lack of resources or time, or as we all recently experienced, the inability to even leave our houses. And that's why I'm so excited to present one of Cornell's soon to be newest digital collections, Selections from the Giraud D. Brill Collection. This will be published in mid-December. This digital collection was largely created by one of our speakers today, Claire Kororatan, so I'll let her talk about its importance. But I wanna zoom out and look at the landscape of archival collections as a whole. I often find that while researchers are very attuned to the collections at their own institutions, it's more difficult for anyone to get a clear picture of all the relevant collections that are out there at the multitude of different universities and libraries and archives that may have collected on the subject. And so we conceived of this series across the archives. Give me one second, admitting people in from the waiting room. We've conceived of this series across the archives that brings together in conversation similar collections that are housed in geographically disparate institutions. Our hope is that the talks tonight will not only enlighten you on the subject of colonial photography on the Philippines, but it will also help to deconstruct the silos within which our archival collections can become trapped. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker today, is Dr. Marthy Dor Mary Dorothy Jose. Dottie is an associate professor at the Department of Social Sciences and associate dean for academic affairs at the College of Arts and Sciences, the University of Philippines, Manila, where she has also served as the convener of the Manila Studies Program and coordinator of the Office of the Gender Program. She finished her BA in history, her master's in Asian studies and her PhD in Philippine studies at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. In January, 2018, she was awarded the University Library Fellowship by the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Michigan for her research entitled Race, Gender, and Photography, Images of Filipino Women in the 1904 St. Louis Exposition, which was also awarded first prize in the first Virginia B. Licuanan uh, History Writing Contest sponsored by the Ateneo de Manila University Library of Women's Writings. Her dissertation is entitled Women, Photography, and History, an Analysis of the Images of Women in American Colonial Photography. Our second speaker tonight is Claire Kororatan, a sixth-year PhD candidate in history at Cornell University. Her dissertation, tentatively titled Employments of Freedom, Agricultural Development, and the Philippine Question, 1898 to 1941, examines the relationship between the ideas of agricultural development and state capitalism in the Philippines. She explores how imperial and racial understandings of land and property suffuse American and Filipino discourses of national development through the first half of the 20th century. I'm now going to bring up our first talk for tonight. So please be patient while I prepare to share my screen. Dati has recorded her presentation uh, just in case of technical difficulties. Pleasant day to all of you. Uh, good morning from the Philippines. 
I am uh, delighted to be invited to deliver a short talk on the DNC Worcester Collection at the University of Michigan Archives. I would like to emphasize that I do not claim to be an expert on the Dean Worcester Collection, since there are significant studies on the said collection already, such as those done by Mark Rice, Christopher Capozola, Nerissa Balse, to name a few. But I am here to share with you what I was able to gather from my short stint at the UM as a youth fellow in 2018. Specifically, my research was uh, focused on the images of Filipino women in the Worcester collection and how photography was used to propagate racial and gender ideology in the early 20th century Philippines, taking into consideration the observation that gender remains an unexplored theme in colonial photography. But first, let me share with you the library fellowship provided by the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, or SEAS, of the U of M, which offered a four-week research fellowship to Southeast Asian scholars to use the research resources of the U of M. I had a chance to access primary sources on the images of women in colonial photography through this research fellowship last January 2018 wherein I used archival research as a methodology from the U of M archives, which boasts of their unique Philippine-American collection. Fortunately, I was able to access loose photos from the Worcester collection as well as digitized ones. So while I was at an arbor, I stayed at the International House and Arbor, formerly ECIR, which is a century-old institution serving the housing needs of international students. And from there, I would just walk my way to the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library, which is the university's largest and most historic library. I was also able to go to the Bentley Historical Library, which is the campus archive for the U of M and is located on the U of M's North Campus. I would also normally go to the Michigan Union to have lunch, uh, usually at Panda Express or Wendy's, depending on the budget. Also, part of the research fellowship was to enjoy research space and computing privileges at the university, as well as assistance from the Southeast Asia Research Librarian, Ma'am Fe Susan Go, uh, who has been very kind and helpful to me. In fact, we still keep in touch and we have collaborated on certain projects already. I am also thankful to Fulbright Language Teaching Assistant William Mel Paglinawan for assisting me during my stay at Ann Arbor. As an introduction, Dean C. Worcester served as Secretary of Interior in the U.S. colonial government in the Philippines from 1890 to 1913. During that time, he was able to take thousands of photographs of people and places throughout the Philippines. While these photos were intended to document Philippine life during the early years of American occupation of the Philippines, they are also suggestive of the perspectives of a leading proponent of the colonial mission. The Dean C. Worcester Photographic Collection at the U of M was a result of Worcester family's donation after he died, and was housed in the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology's Worcester Collection. However, the said museum was under renovation when I was there at the U of M, so what I was able to access were those found at the Bentley Historical Library. Aside from the Bentley Historical Library, the Worcester Photographic Collection can also be found, as I mentioned, at the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, as well as the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology. Fortunately, most of these photos uh, from the said collection have already been digitized and can be accessed at the U of M library website. Some of the photos I used for my research came from the U of M website. Specifically, I searched for images of Filipino women suggesting forms of sexism such as domesticity, uh, objectification, and exoticism. In analyzing the images of Filipino women in the Dean Worcester collection, I have categorized them into three groups, indigenous women, Muslim women, and Christian women. 
instead of the categories used by the Americans who classified the inhabitants of the Philippines as belonging to the Christian and non-Christian tribes. Utilizing intersectional feminism as the framework for this study, I considered various identities of women, such as gender, race, ethnicity, religion, and class in analyzing their images, hoping to formulate a more nuanced understanding of their representations in colonial photography. In this photo, we can see an image of Bontok women in banana leaf costumes. They were half naked and, can, and we can see the expression of these women who seemed to show discomfort while their picture was being taken, except for the woman at the farthest left who was not looking at the camera and who appeared to be tough and oblivious to the camera in front of them. This particular image suggests exoticism of indigenous women, a form of representation in which people are depicted as foreign from the perspective of the intended audience a term encompassing the others. In this photo, Dean Worcester is uh, uh, standing beside a Negrito woman. It seems that Dean Worcester had a penchant for putting his six foot tall body side by side with the natives to emphasize the stark physical differences. Images like these helped cement racism against Filipinos and boosted the American colonial project. This photo implies not only racism, but also sexism if we consider the interplay of race, gender, and ethnicity in analyzing the photo. In this slide, we can see two photos of a Bagobo woman, where the photo on the left shows the Bagobo woman looking at the camera, while the photo on the right shows a side view of the Bagobo woman. Aside from showing the elaborate details of the Bagobo woman's clothing, what is shown here seems to be the physical features of the Bagobo woman, hence the front view and the side view. The images seem to imply the taking of the indigenous women's photographs for scientific purposes, intending to show details of the physical characteristics of the Bagobo women. Since the thrust of Worcester's depiction of the Muslims was their fierceness, Muslim men were given more attention than the Muslim women. Consequently, women seem to be missing in the narratives, while images of Muslim women are very limited. This photo shows two women dancing the traditional Muslim dance in front of the audience, including Governor General William Howard Taft. This photo shows one of the traditional roles associated to women, which is being entertainers. In this photo, we can see an image of a Muslim family in which only Datu Pedro Cuevas was introduced with his family. Note that Datu Pedro's wife and daughter were wearing rosaries on their hands, and this is because they were Christianized since Pedro Cuevas was a Tagalog Christian born in Cavite, but because he fought the Spaniards, he was exiled to Sambuanga until he reached Basilan, where his courage and strength became known earning him the title as the chief of Basilan and became known as, that, as Pedro Cuevas Datu Calun. He married the daughter of the Sultan, Uraya or Mania, Ayakan, who was a Muslim but agreed to be baptized as a Christian, and Mary in a Catholic rite. Therefore, Uraya was a Muslim woman who became a Catholic but decided to retain her Muslim identity as reflected in her manner of clothing. Christian women wore the native baro, or camisa, or shirt, or blouse, and saya, a long skirt, a legacy of Spanish colonialism. Women from the elite class were usually shown in photos wearing camisas with butterfly or angel sleeves and overflowing skirts, sometimes without the panuelo, or the triangular piece of cloth worn as an accessory to the baro and tapis, a piece of cloth wrapped around the upper part of the saya or the long skirt. As these accessories were more commonly used by women from the working class, because of their utilitarian functions, the panuelo could be used to wipe off a woman's sweat while the tapis was used to cover the thin material of their skirts. In this photo, we can see a mestiza from Negros wearing a pompous barot saya, the traditional blouse and skirt, standing in the living room of a bahay na bato or house of stone, also known as Casa Filipino, 
Her hand was touching the table while looking to the left. The borrowed saya was imposed by the Spaniards as women's clothing during the colonial period as a way of civilizing the natives, which emanated from the Catholic teaching that women should cover their bodies so that men will not be tempted to have malicious thoughts about them. This tradition of wearing the borrowed saya continued until the first decades of the 20th century. Weaving has always been in the realm of women as practiced by indigenous groups in the Philippines, such as the Tibolis from southern Mindanao, who were regarded as dream weavers. Weaving continued to be an activity associated with women even in the succeeding colonial periods. According to Stephanie Koo in 2019, photos depicting women weavers in stylish clothes were a common trend. This style of clothing must have been too sophisticated for their daily work and may have been handed to them for pictorial or entertainment purposes, possibly because their normal appearance or clothing was not worthy enough to be displayed. Women weavers who usually do their work at home were probably dressed more casually than how they were depicted in photos. As noted by Nerissa Balse in 2017, images such as this confirm that the Philippines has entered a post-war period and that now as a settled U.S. colony, it has begun to rehabilitate itself as a modern society interested in such progressive endeavors as household industries. In this photo, we can see an image of three women who were in the weaving industry. Two women were sitting on a mat both were looking at the camera while the third woman was sitting on the bench, not looking at the camera. They were wearing the barot saya, signifying they were Christians. This photo suggests that weaving is an activity associated with women. Note that the two women's hair were tied in a bun, while the third woman was wearing her hair loose. And if we compare their clothing, it was simpler compared with that of the woman from Negros, suggesting that these women came from ordinary families. Some photos from the Worcester collection show women in various activities such as weaving and washing clothes, which is suggestive of the gendered spaces occupied by women from the working class in the early part of the 20th century. When the Spanish colonizers introduced Christianity in the Philippines as part of their mission, Women's sexuality and overall concepts of morality were transformed according to the Catholic teachings. Unlike in the pre-colonial period when women enjoyed rights and privileges and a greater amount of freedom, their mobility was restricted during colonial times when they were confined to domestic spaces. In this photo, we can see a Tagalog woman doing her laundry using the traditional palo-palo or paddle a piece of wood used to beat clothes while doing laundry to make them pristine and clean. She was seated with her butt on the ground. Her hair was tied in a bun with a comb attached to her hair. And her shoulders were exposed while wearing a long skirt wrapped around her body. We can deduce from this photo the traditional way of washing clothes using the palo-palo. And that washing clothes is an activity done by women, especially women from the lower class. To summarize, the photos show the Christian women as civilized, the indigenous women as primitive, and the secondary role of the Muslim women. The indigenous women were exoticized, emphasizing on their nudity, which could be interpreted as obscene by the Westerners, but as a manifestation of sexual freedom by the indigenous groups. Muslim women were depicted as slightly civilized, having a secondary role in society, and as victims of patriarchy, as suggested by other photos of Muslim women being depicted in terms of poly uh, the polygamous practice among Muslim men. While Christian women were depicted as being educated, religious, and the most civilized among the Filipino women. However, it should be noted that the indigenous people were neither primitive nor uncivilized, but were seen as such through imperialist eyes using Western standards of civilization. While these photos of the Filipino women from the Worcester collection show racist and sexist images of them, annotating these images would show that they were misrepresented and underrepresented in colonial photography. Looking at women's roles in Philippine history would show that the Filipino women have gone a long way 
from the pre-colonial times when they enjoyed so many rights and freedom that were taken away from them during the Spanish colonial period. Studies showed that the indigenous women like the Igorot women were engaged in weaving, agriculture, and pottery making, and enjoyed sexual freedom while the Negrito women were active in trade, hunting, and healing. The Muslim women, on the other hand, enjoyed certain rights and privileges such as receiving dowry upon marriage and the rights to divorce. They also enjoyed a certain amount of political, cultural, military, and economic powers as well as reproductive rights. While the Christian women exhibited forms of resistance to colonial rule, such as the strike of the Cigarreras in 1816, the establishment of a school by the 20 women of Malolos in 1888, women's involvement in the 1896 revolution and the Philippine-American War, women's campaign for the right to vote, and the involvement of women in labor unions during the American colonial period. The significant status of Filipino women in society were not reflected in these photos. Instead, what we learned from these photos were the gender stereotypes the Americans wanted to propagate to create a colonial society where women's subordination to men seems to coincide with America's subjugation of the Philippines as a colony. Indeed, analyzing colonial photography could reveal as much or even more about the identity and subjectivity of the colonizer as about the colony and its people. To conclude, colonial photography must be analyzed critically to better understand its role in shaping and propagating racial and gender stereotypes. Accepting women's images in colonial photography as reflections of reality might, might preclude our full understanding of women's place in history and society. Moreover, the use of intersectional feminism is advised for a more nuanced analysis of women's representations in colonial photography to highlight the different experiences of women based on various identities such as gender, race, ethnicity, religion, and social class. Lastly, colonial photography's claim to neutrality must always be questioned, for it can also be used as an instrument of women's underrepresentation or misrepresentation and a means of portraying a manufactured truth regarding its subject. So that would be all. Maraming salamat. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dati. Now I would like to ask Claire if you could begin your talk as well. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, let me just pull on my camera. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for um, attending our event today. So um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Claire um, and I'm a PhD candidate in the history department at Cornell. Um, so my talk today is entitled Agrarianism and U.S. Empire in the Philippines, um, selections from the Jero Dubril collection at Cornell. Um, yeah. So I guess just to kind of briefly introduce myself. Um, so uh, broadly speaking, my dissertation is about discourses of agricultural development in the Philippines during the U.S. colonial period. Um, specifically, I'm interested in the history of public land laws um, and the intersection between those laws and agricultural projects of agricultural colonization in um, the so-called frontier regions of the Philippines. Um, and so overall, I'm interested in the figure of the farmer as a kind of centralizing figure in understanding um, and sort of creating uh, meanings of Philippine citizenship, um, which then relates to how um, ideas of self-determination or independence are kind of discussed. Um, and so that's about me. Um, this presentation specifically is about um, a collection, a digital collection that I helped digitize, which is based on the, um, one second here, okay. Yeah, which is based on the, 
glass negatives from Jared Debril, um, and I'll share a bit more about his bio in a little bit. Um, but basically, yeah, so what were my goals for this project? Um, coming into Cornell, I was always very much aware of Cornell's deep history um, with the Imperial Project in the Philippines. Um, the first head of the Philippine Commission was the president at that time, Cornell president at that time, Jacob Sherman. Um, and so he was sort of the first person who, who kind of delineated like the preliminary policies for civil rule. Um, and although the more famous commission is the Taft Commission, I just think that that's a really important point, the fact that the Cornell president was appointed as head of the first Philippine Commission. Um, and throughout the years, Cornell has sort of been, I guess, involved to some extent in a lot of institutional building in the Philippines. Um, a lot of Philippine pensionados or Philippine students studied at Cornell in the early 20th century. Um, and Cornell was also very heavily involved in post-World War II reconstruction. Um, for instance, the reconstruction of University of the Philippines Los Baños, which is a major institution for agricultural and life sciences in the Philippines. And so there's always been a link between Cornell and sort of these like technical um, institutions, um, which is related to what I'm interested in. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I just kind of wanted to highlight that with this collection and also kind of make sure that Cornell has something <laughs> out in the public about the Philippines, because I think that that's important. Um, a lot of the institutions where scholars go in the U.S. are University of Michigan, um, which Professor Jose went to, as well as Wisconsin-Madison, but there is stuff at Cornell, so part of this project is kind of um, aiming to sort of publicize those materials and invite people to come to Cornell to use the materials there. Um, another primary goal for me was to increase archival access. So. I know that it's just really difficult for scholars in the Philippines to access archival materials, both in the US and even in the Philippines. Um, and I'm currently in the Philippines now, so I'm very uh, familiar with this experience. And so um, I just think, you know, conversations about digital repatriation are very important. Um, and so this is sort of my small attempt at contributing to that. Um, and then finally, I would say that um, I'm not very well steeped in the literature on colonial photography. This is actually the first time that I've delved into colonial photographs. I'm much more interested in questions of in institutional building and political economy. Um, and so to some extent, th that said, there is just so much about colonial photography. So to some extent, this was my attempt at kind of engaging with photographs but perhaps with a different lens um, or framework in mind. And so um, maybe that'll be sort of evident in how I talk about the photographs and sort of explain how I related with them. Um, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so who is Brill? Um, he was uh, an eight, he was a graduate of the School of Agriculture. He graduated in 1888. Um, and he was a scientific explorer for the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, and I'll read from his bio. So um, in the early 20th century, he was in charge of the Hubei Agricultural College and Experimental Farm in Wuchang, China. And at that point, he was planning to explore the upper Yangtze Valley around the time of the Boxer Rebellion. So I'll say that actually the Brill collection isn't just about the Philippines. There's materials about China, um, I believe Egypt and India. Um, and so that's a potential area to explore some of these um, transnational collections. Um, so his work involved plant introduction, agricultural education in new scientific fields such as horticulture and also investigations of potential transplantation of seedlings from the Far East into the United States. So basically he was in charge of identifying potential plants that could then be planted in the US for sort of large scale production. Um, so perhaps because of his Cornell connections or maybe because he was already in Asia, 
um, when the Philippine American War happened, which was in 1898, um, he was asked to lead an agricultural school in the Philippines under the Department of Public Education. So the premise of the appointment was that he would kind of survey the agricultural conditions in the Philippines and kind of develop a curriculum or be in charge of the school. Um, and initially, the idea would be for the school to be established in La Granja, which is a sugar plantation of Juan Araneta, who was um, a sugar planter in Negros Island in the middle part of the Philippines. Um, the primary sugar producing region of the Philippines. Um, interestingly, Brill didn't fulfill his, or he ended up not fulfilling um, his position, not because of his fault, but because there were just a lot of bureaucratic squabbles between the Bureau of Agriculture and the Department of Public Instruction for the Philippines. Um, and this is a letter sort of from um, from his potential boss who was asking like, okay, Brill is waiting, what's going on? Um, and I share this because I think it's sort of indicative of some of the conflicting goals at that time. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the squabbles were about, but my sense is that it relates to what La Granja, um, to different plants of what La Granja, the, station should be? Should it be more of a plantation or should it be a school? And so there's sort of ways in which the plantation space and the educational space kind of overlap. And I think Brill is sort of in the middle of that conflict, um, which is why he ended up not fulfilling his post. But um, while waiting to start his position, he did travel throughout the Philippines um, to survey agricultural conditions there. Um, and so that's the premise of the photos that he took. Um, okay, so what is in this collection? Um, so like I mentioned, there's other photos not related to the Philippines, but the ones that are about the Philippines, there's about 300 or so glass negatives. Um, and so I just have these photos here to show you guys what they actually look like. Um, so they're in about three to four boxes and I, I had never worked with glass negatives before, but they're literally glass um, and they're kind of hard to see, like to, to sort of see, it's hard to see the photos in the full detail because they're just in black and white. Um, so here you have the original glass negatives um, and then the envelopes that they came with. Um, so the photos that I picked were specifically about um, the agricultural related materials, but there there is also other stuff in the collection that I unfortunately didn't have space for. Um, and that's stuff relating to um, churches. There were a lot of um, photos of destroyed churches, um, a lot of photos of destroyed infrastructure. So my sense is that Brill kind of arrived in the Philippines, right? Maybe sort of um, when some of these places had been so-called pacified. So he had he was able to like capture some of those initial um yeah like images of yeah public infrastructure being destroyed um which i think is important um but yeah specifically the photos that i selected had to do with agriculture um so they include stuff about yeah rural farming scenes things about local industry there are a lot of photos about duck farming, about pottery. Um, there's also photos about the Rinderpest vaccination campaign, which I'll talk a little bit about, market scenes, schools, like I mentioned, um, and then also images of war. Um, and so the potential themes that people might explore with this collection are, um, yeah, themes about science or scholars who are sort of involved in these literatures could engage with this collection, I think. So that includes science and technology studies, scholars in environmental history, political ecology, military history, colonial historiography, visual studies and colonial photography, race and empire and pragmatism and empire. Okay, so I'll just share a bit about, or I'll just share a couple of samples um, of, photos that I thought were really striking in this collection. 
Um, so here are some photos about agriculture. I just thought the one on the left was really striking just because of its representation of plantation logics at that time. I'm not entirely sure who this man is and what he's looking at, but it just strikes me as, I don't know, something potentially related to monocrop agriculture. Um, and then the photo on the left is a photo of an irrigation system. Um, a lot of the uh, sort of written records of the Philippines at that time always talk about how, you know, backwards the agriculture was, like how it was not very modern. And so as someone very much interested in reading those texts, it was really helpful for me to actually see like visual representations of what people at that time were seeing and what they were calling sort of traditional. And so I guess this is what they called as traditional. <laughs> Um, this bamboo irrigation system, which I thought was actually really cool. Um, so here are some scenes relating to commerce and industry. The one on the left is a photo of a duck farm. Um, and this is actually a duck farm in Pasig River. Um, and if you've seen photos of Pasig River today, this just looks very different. Um, and the one on the left is just a photo of a very lively market. Um, which I think is really interesting to think about in relation to how the U.S. officials at that time kind of justified U.S. occupation as supposedly um, cultivating um, economic development. So it's just interesting to see, you know, what were at that time already established markets. Um, here are more photos relating to industry. The one on the left is photo is a photo of, I believe, a family, I guess, hand milling. Um, this is, I'm thinking, right under their house, just because there's a man looking out the window and some children um, at the bottom of the house, like uh, close to the stilts here at the bottom of the house. And then on the right is a photo of a man um, working in an abaha plantation. Abaha is Manila hemp. Um, which was an important product for shipping um, just because it's used for ropes. So it was really important for just any kind of shipping for products or commerce, but also for war um, because it was an important product for the Navy. Um, and then here are some photos relating to schools. Um, a lot of the literature on education and U.S. empire focus on language and how, um, you know, Americans wanted everyone to learn English. But I think one of the things that is missed is how important technical knowledge was. Um, so there was a lot of schools established relating to agriculture. Again, this was the premise of Brill's appointment to the Philippines. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I think can be done in relation to like vocational education, technical education, um, and the establishment of experimental farms um, as a sort of node for, you know, potentially spreading technical knowledge throughout the archipelago. Um, and also a lot of these farms, I think, are centers for, um, or a lot of these farms were established soon after a particular municipality or barrio became pacified. So I think it's also interesting to think about schools in relation to the counterinsurgency effort. Um, here are some photos of the Rinderpest vaccination campaign, um, and I'll just read a data point. So in 1902, around 629,000 cattle died, with about 50,000 animals dead in each of the key provinces of Negros, Bohol, Cebu, Iloilo, and Leyte, and those are um, important agricultural regions in the Philippines. Um, and so I think it's really hard to overemphasize um, the devastation that this that this render pest had caused, um, not only in terms of agriculture and food production, but also in terms of um, political economy. Cattle was a really important property to a large extent, um, not just for individual family people, like they're not just individual property, but they're also like communal property. And so I think a lot is involved with um, just large amounts of Carabao dying. Um, and then also Americans sort of coming in and saying that they, you know, successfully 
contributed to Philippine development by vaccinating all of the cattle. Um, scholars have suggested that rinderpest actually increased due to the American army obtaining Carabao for military transportation, as well as from the refugees taking the surviving Carabao into new regions um, for small scale farming. And so um, I think, um, yeah, there's a lot going on here with this Rinderfest vaccination campaign that could be explored in terms of its relationship to um, both the counterinsurgency effort as well as questions about property, which is what I'm interested in. Um, and then this photo, I think, is one of the most important photos in the collection. Um, at first glance, it just looks like a kind of typical rural scene, um, actually quite idyllic with the Carabao coming down the road. Um, but the caption is family returning from concentration camp with house, household goods, pig and chickens on Carabao cart over new road built by Americans. Um, so again, one of the things that I'm interested in is the relationship between agricultural development and questions of self-determination. And I think um, agriculture discourses of agricultural development are very deeply intertwined with the counterinsurgency effort, um, particularly, particularly in terms of so-called like resettling pacified natives, um, giving them technology, giving them agricultural implements to supposedly, you know, start a new life. Um, and I think this plays a role in narratives of benevolent imperialism at that time. Um, so I'll just share this quote briefly. I'll try to read it quickly because I'm almost at time. But this is a quote from a testimony of a journalist who was in the Philippines, an American journalist who was in the Philippines, um, when he was asked to describe the nature of the concentration camp in the Philippines. Um, so he said, it is a misnomer to call it a policy of concentration because the world has learned to put a significant meaning to that word. The policy practiced in the Philippines has no element of cruelty to it. It is simply an order to the inhabitants of a particular locality to move from one portion to another, and there they reside and carry on their operations and business. The people are pleased with it because they are permitted to lead an easier life, much easier than at home. There is no element of punishment or deprivation they are simply requested to come into a certain district. Um, so yeah, I guess part of this is related to my interest in the relationship between agricultural development, histories of settlement, um, and uh, it's just very much evident here in this collection, but I think it sort of trickles into the rest of the US colonial period. Um, and even after World War II, this is just like a persistent through line in Philippine history. The yeah, relationship between counterinsurgency efforts, histories of settlement that aren't called forced settlement, but as one can see here, sort of benevolent, I guess, is how it would be described. Um, and the supposed lack of force in these histories. Um, and it's just, I think, so um, kind of, well captured in this photograph here. Um, so I'll just share a couple of quick reflections, which I've already kind of alluded to, um, which is just how the Braille collection um, represents or doesn't represent benevolent empire. Um, one of the things that I really liked, if I can say the word like, about these photos is their sort of documentary aspect and their kind of candidness. Um, so there is a focus on everyday life. A lot of these photos were taken maybe while Braille was like physically moving. So for instance, he might've been on a boat or like in like a carriage or something. And so they don't have a staged quality to them, which I appreciated because um, there's a lot more photos um, of portraits or yeah, staged photographs. And so I sort of appreciated the documentary aspect of this. Um, and maybe one of the questions I have is to what extent Brill was taking this just for his personal records um, or whether he was taking them for public release. Um, a lot of the soldiers at that time were given cameras. I think this was one of the first wars where like the photograph actually plays a huge role in, ter in terms of understanding the meaning of empire. And so, 
this is something that I'm sort of grappling with the relationship between like the documentary aspect of these photos and potential relationships to propagandistic efforts on behalf of US army officials. Um, one of the things that I'm also interested in is the absence or presence of representations of war and violence. Um, there's a lot of photographs generally about dead bodies, um, photographs of war, photographs of cruel punishment and um, sort of very visceral representations of war. Um, but perhaps because Braille was interested in agricultural development, which is arguably a more dry topic, um, that those representations of war and violence aren't really um, represented in the actual photographs to a large extent. Um, but they're there if one perhaps knows how to engage with the photos or sort of sees the traces of those violence in the photos. Um, and so I just think that sort of the absence or presence of representations of war and violence is sort of telling and generative for understanding how narratives of benevolent empire are constructed. Um, I'll just share here quickly other resources um, that folks might be interested in. Um, this is very US based because this is the stuff that I'm more familiar with. But if you have other resources, please let us know so we can hopefully kind of connect a lot of these digital resources together. Um, so there are other Braille related materials at the USDA National Agricultural Library. There's also a lot of stuff about agriculture in the Smithsonian and the New York Botanical Gardens. Um, and of course, Library of Congress and the National Archives are just huge resources um, for anyone interested in the Philippines. Um, as everyone knows, um, the University of Mich Michigan has a very large digital collection and I use it a lot. <laughs> other Philippine scholars do too. Um, but obviously that's related to this. Um, there's also other Southeast Asia materials, um, although less related to agriculture or to Braille, but in case you know anyone is interested or would like to learn more, there's the Southeast Asia Visions Collection at Cornell and also materials coming from the Committee on Research Materials in Southeast Asia. Um, there's also a growing number of photo essays um, published online. One example is the MIT Visualizing Cultures essay. Um, and then when the, um, the digital collection is released, I wrote a blog post. It's not exactly a photo essay, but um, it's just sort of an overview of what the collection is about. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of keep a running list of these. Um, if you have any, feel free to email me so I can um, keep track and then also potentially like have a more curated or like a public repository of these um, all put together in the same place. Um, yeah, so uh, just some suggestions for anyone interested in this collection and how to kind of expand on it. Um, so again, I listed the themes here that I think are related. Um, other avenues to explore would be transnational links. So like I mentioned, Braille wasn't just in the Philippines. You traveled to China, Egypt, India, um, Indonesia. And so there is just some interesting things there that I think could be said about the relationship between science and empire. Um, a lot of the stuff about the US involvement in the Philippines is sort of talked about in terms of scientific collaboration, um, whether that's you know north to south or colonizer to colonize. But I think this also has implications for understanding um, histories of scientific collaboration between formerly colonized countries. Um, so that's something to explore. And then also folks who are interested in plantation logics. I think there's just a lot here in this collection. Um, so yeah, like Emily said, the digital collection hasn't been released yet, but I think it'll be released in mid-December. So please keep an eye out for it. And for those who are based in the Philippines, um, and would like to learn more about this collection, including the ones that didn't get select, the photos that didn't get selected, please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to talk more about it. Um, I just wanna give thanks to the people who were involved um, in putting this together. Emily, who has been so closely involved from the very beginning, thank you so much. Um, the DCAPS team, Agatha, Jasmine, and Mary, um, and also Tabitha from the Rare and Manuscript Collections. Um, there's just a lot more that's going on behind the scenes that I'm not even aware of. Um, folks are working on the 
on putting this collection online. And so sort of their folks are working on it <laughs> without me. And so, um, yeah, there's just a lot going on to put this together. And so thank you to everyone. Um, and then I also just wanted to give thanks to Chris Chen, who I had spoken to early in this project. Um, he's based in Mindanao. Um, he's working with Mindanao State University. So he was sort of helpful in kind of thinking about what the value of this project might be for um, scholars who are based in the Philippines. Um, finally, I'll just end with this photograph, which I love. Um, planting, the title is planting, the caption that Brill wrote was planting rice to music, musicians under the umbrella. And I just thought this was a really unexpected photo. Um, as you can see, it's deteriorating. Um, and this is why the collection is being digitized and also preserved. Um, so further deterioration like this can be prevented. But I actually like the, the compositionally, I think it adds to the photo. Um, and I think it reveals something about the status of Philippine archives and just deterioration in the archives um, and what it means to engage with photographs despite or through that deterioration. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I'll just end there. Thank you so much to both of our speakers. Uh, I'm going to change the settings now. So attendees, you're able to unmute yourselves and start your videos if you would so like. And I now invite questions. We've got a few minutes left. If you don't wish to unmute, you can also put your question in the chat. I've got a question to start off with um, while we wait and see if anyone in the audience has any. Dottie, I was wondering if you could talk more about your work in the archives. Um, could you tell me you know, what was the most unexpected thing that you discovered during your research? Hi, um, so I was at the University of Michigan uh, for a fellowship uh, in 2018. And uh, well, I, I can say that at first my focus was to look for photos from the 1904 St. Louis Exposition. The, uh, well, uh, same uh, goal, no, same uh, objective uh, to look for representations of women you know, uh, in the said collection. But uh, I was able to expand my research to include other uh, colonial photography collections like uh, uh, the Dean Worcester collection and uh, as well as the American travelogues. So in my dissertation, I was able to use the three collections when initially I was just there to search for the 1904 St. Louis Exposition photographs of women. So I think uh, the collection of the University of Michigan uh, Library and Archives uh, is a very diverse uh, uh, in terms of Philippine American uh, studies. Thank you. Claire, I also have a question for you as well. Um, so I know that digitization work was something that was new for you. Um, and, and so, um, what were some of the challenges that you faced that you didn't expect when working on that digitization project? Um, yeah, I guess I didn't realize the amount of work involved. <laughs> um, as someone who likes having stuff digitized, um, I guess I was just like, oh, why doesn't someone just, you know, put it online? um as if it were easy um but yeah there's just a lot of steps involved to actually put this together and so that was something that I discovered and kind of understood more intimately by working on this project just like you know selecting the photos um creating the meta metadata looking through the captions um so yeah, that like very close engagement with the material was just something that I guess I appreciated and kind of understood more um, by working on this project. Um, yeah, I guess I'd say, yeah, I'll end there. Thank you. 
We have a question in the chat. In relation to photographs of Igorot women, what do you think is worth exploring at this time? Hi. Um, as for the Igorot women, I think um, we could uh, explore uh, the photographs uh, show, um, featuring the Ulog. Uh, if you are familiar with the um, Ulog, no, uh, among the uh, Igorot. Uh, well, uh, the Ulog uh, has been described by some writers as the, the pre-Christian motel because uh, yeah, basically the Ulog is a sort of a dormitory for uh, for women, no, for young women who are about to to marry, and then uh, and there, actually, it's a place of courtship in Bontok society. And it's a place where they could uh, test their sexual compatibility. And according to sources, uh, even American sources in the early 20th century, um, a couple would be allowed to marry if uh, the girl gets pregnant. So uh, I encountered some photographs of uh, uh, women as well as men you know, from the Igorot society. Uh, showing the ulog, so I think uh, it's one of the um, uh, topics or themes that is worth exploring at this time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jamwell. You can go ahead and unmute and ask your question, and then we'll address some of the others in the chat. Right. Thank you, um, Emily. Um, I just would like to say thank you first to. Dr. Claire and Dr. Dottie for the fantastic presentation. I think about the intersection between both of your presentations for today. I think about Dean Worcester's photos and his role on the invested interest of the US empire to the agricultural program of the Philippines like until 1910. And I also think about like embodied resistance of the photos. Like if one could argue about the continued resistance, for example, the Filipinos in the stillness of the photograph that Dr. Dottie has presented, um, perhaps there's more than just the staging or the everydayness of the photos. So what do you think are some embodied forms of speaking back that these photos bring to your analysis, if any? For Dr. Claire in particular, what's poignant to me in your presentation was the absence of documented indigenous communities and the wealth of their knowledge systems in terms of agriculture, for example, I think about their use of the stars to know when is the best season to plant a particular um, um, agricultural product. And for, for Dr. Dotti, in the overwhelming presence of indigenous communities, uh, of course, in the 1904 World's Fair, were there performances of subversion in the photos that you have seen or hinted? Thank you. Um, so um, I will answer first, Claire. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question, uh, Sir Manuel. Right? Yeah, uh, I think that's uh, another theme that needs to be explored because I I was not able to look into that in my uh, research. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so. Um, I guess if I understood your question correctly about embodiment, um, but you can tell me if I didn't. Um, one of the ways in which I guess it may be evident in the photos is um, just, yeah, people's engagement with the camera, I guess. So I didn't really include um, this in the samples that I showed, but one of the things I thought that was interesting was like, scenes where you know some people are looking away but then there's like children who are like very much like comfortable with the camera which I thought was interesting um so I guess maybe that's like one way in which like in terms of like people's physical react like his subject's physical reaction to the camera I guess that could be something that one could explore um in relation to indigeneity yes they are in the photographs um, so there's pictures of um, Banawe rice, I, I, 
now I'm like trying to decide or think about whether um, it ended up making it to the collection, but there's photos about like the Northern part of the Philippines. Um, and then also photos um, in, uh, with photos with which include the um, governor of Nova Vizcaya um, with some, you know, Igorot people. Um, so they are there. Um, I guess I just kind of didn't include it here in my presentation just because I think there's just so much literature on that topic. Um, and those aren't necessarily my interests, um, but yes, they will be in the collection um, or they are in the collection. Um, and then in terms of indigenous systems of knowledge, um, admittedly, this is something that I struggle with. Um, so um, I'm not really going to assume that Brill knows what to look for. <laughs> um, I mean, he took photos of a bamboo irrigation system and maybe for him that what counted as an indigenous way of farming. Um, so I'm not necessarily going to assume that he can distinguish different practices, I guess, um, especially if he was just a visitor for um, a couple of months. Um, and so I guess I'm not necessarily engaging with these photos to um, identify those indigenous practices that as they might have been at that time, but perhaps see um, how he represented or he took photos of what he was seeing. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess that would be my answer to that question. Thank you both. I know we're at time and there are still a few questions, so I understand if folks have to leave. Um, we'll try to address two more questions. First one from the chat and then Ruchia, you, you can ask your question. Um, so from Francis, he says, I'm curious how many materials related to the US colonial project in the Philippines are not currently digitized? I don't even know how to begin to answer that question, but what I can say is so many more than there are digitized. Um, we call these collections hidden collections in libraries where they exist, but their traces um, are few on the internet. And so they can be harder to find if you don't already know that they exist in the first place. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone can speak to more specifics there, but but definitely more than you can find digitized. Right. I mean, I just add, uh, Emily, uh, that the Department of Foreign Affairs in the Philippines has, has an ongoing project and uh, wherein uh, there was a budget um, allocated to eight universities, uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, Tamasat University, York University, and five other universities were part of the project was the digitization of uh, Filipiniana materials in these universities. So I think uh, this could help you know, in the digitization of uh, Philippine uh, studies materials in other universities. Thank you. And I see the follow-up question, how can we engage with those hidden collections? That's really, that's the really key question, right? I would suggest one way to do that is to reach out to librarians. And so I'm putting here in the chat, a list of the contact information for um, many of the librarians and archivists who work with these leading collections of Southeast Asian studies, at least in the United States. Um, these are the experts on the topics and they are the ones who will be able to help direct you to find what you're looking for. So if you have a question um, or a specific research subject, I really suggest uh, reaching out. Um, Ruchi, would you like to ask your question? Uh... First, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Jose and also Claire for their uh, wonderful talk. Uh, first, uh, well, my question is basically for uh, Claire because it's the first time I heard about the Brill Collection uh, in, um, in Cornell. So like, uh, because I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a page, I'm a PhD candidate at the Murdoch University and I'm working on um, history of flooding in uh, Ilo, Ilo City, Central Philippines. So I just wonder if like, because I'm planning actually to go on, uh, on, a, on a research tour within the United States to check if there are like materials that I could, uh, I could check because for, for once I know like uh, with Michigan and uh, I thankfully also shared your email. So I, I, uh, I will probably email you anytime soon. But the question is like with the Brill collection, how extensive uh, as, 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 as you saw it at the moment, how extensive it, it is 
um, in terms of, say, in the Philippines geographically, does it have uh, material on, say, Central, Central Philippines or like Southern Philippines? Um, yeah, so he did travel across the Philippines. So he has photos on Apari, Cagayan, and then Romblon. Um, mm -hmm. In Central Luzon, I don't think he knew where he was. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of the description just said nearby Manila. Um, mm -hmm. So there's photos of Mahay Hai. Um, so I think that's the ex that was maybe the farthest that he went. My sense is don't quote me on this but i think some caption somewhere said like 40 kilometers from manila so mm -hmm. maybe that's the sort of like geographic scope um yeah but yeah he did travel throughout um at romblon was because he was there for the vaccination campaign and then negros for the sugar mm -hmm. plantation yeah. um i would say that um, he was there for only a short amount of time. Um, so this is really like in terms of time period, very narrow. Um, mm -hmm. Just like 1890, I think 19, sorry, 1901 to 1902. Uh -huh. um, and so they won't really be helpful, I think, in terms of finding like empirical stuff for like yeah. later in the US colonial period. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me and then we can talk yeah, more thank you. about your project. Thank you, I also thank you very much. Learn. Okay. Thank you. I know we're going way over time. So Judith, I'm just going to allow you to um, ask your question or make your comment. And then I'm afraid we'll have to end the webinar. I know we could go on much longer, but if you're in the Philippines, I don't want to take up your Saturday. If you're in the US, it's getting late at night here. Go ahead, Judith. I'm sorry, I don't really want to have the last word, but I did want to give something of a response to the previous question about the extent of the Philippine collections. And you know, at the University of Washington, we have the records of the Alaska Yukon Exposition. And I'm really sorry um, that I missed the, the first part of this presentation. So I missed the, the one about the, um, the other world's fair. Um, some of that material is digitized, but I was just thinking about the scope of the kind of material that we do have in our special collections, and a lot of it is private donations from the families of um, soldiers who went with, there were local units that went to fight. Um, they thought they were fighting in the Spanish, uh, you know, they thought they were going to be fighting the, 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 the Spanish and they ended up, you know, of course, fighting the, the, with the Philippine, the Philippine War. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, just a huge range of material from the kind of official Alaska Yukon stuff to these just private collections and letters from soldiers in the field. So, um, you know, it is, it's worth looking at, you um, I guess OCLC would have, you know, a lot of these kind of manuscript collections um, brought together in some form or another as a kind of archival record. Wouldn't that be correct, um, Emily? Kind of looking looking to you. I mean, we used to have the old paper collection of, you know, the National Un Union Catalog of Manuscripts, but now those things would be on the National Database OCLC for the for the U.S. collections anyway. No, that's, that's a good last word because clearly there is so much appetite for these collections. We can see just here in this, in the audience to, tonight, this morning. Um, and so I'll say we will be sending out a recording of this presentation next week. And with that, I can include, I'll put together a list of the resources that have been mentioned in the talks, mentioned in the chat. We're very lucky to have a number of library librarian experts in the audience today who I know um, can talk about these resources much better than I alone can. Um, so I can send out a list of all those resources later next week. Uh, and then also we will send out a link to the Brill Collection once it is published later in December. So thank you so much. Another round of applause for our speakers. I greatly appreciate you all coming out today and for your engagement in this question and answer session. Have a great weekend, everyone.